This is the Asia Land Birds webinar organized by BirdLife. Uh, the, the main host of the evening is uh, Ding Li Young from the BirdLife Asia office in Singapore. And um, below you will find the Q&A section where you can, any questions you have during the, any of the talks we have today, you can type them in and we'll try to answer them in the Q&A session uh, at the end of all the talks. Um, over to Ding Li. Thanks, Baron. I'm Ding Li from the World Life Secretariat in Singapore, and with me here today and co-hosting with me this webinar is uh, Yu Yat Tong, uh, my colleague from the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society based in Hong Kong. Um, we are very pleased to have you join us uh, this evening on this webinar on uh, migratory land birds in Asia. I'm not sure how many of us here know about the World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, every year, World Migratory Bird Day happens in May and October. And this is roughly time around the time of the year where millions and millions of migratory birds are on the move. So this is a really good time and an opportunity for us to, to remember that uh, migratory birds are out there uh, on their migrations. Uh, it's also a good reminder for us that we need to do more to protect our migratory birds all over the world. Uh, we know that many migratory birds are currently in decline. And uh, here in Asia, uh, more than a third of the world's migratory bird diversity can be found. Uh, yet at the same time, so many of these migratory birds in Asia are in danger of extinction, which means that we here in Asia, we need to do more to, to protect these migratory birds. Uh, I have here with me a very ex esteemed speaker, uh, my colleague uh, Wilhelm Hein from the University of Munster in Germany. I've known Wilhelm for a long time in uh, working on migratory birds and uh, Wilhelm is uh, going to tell us a story of how uh, many of these, of, of these small migratory birds like, like buntings, robins, migrate through the continent. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have read Wilhelm's work, but Wilhelm is a pioneer in, uh, in setting up all these studies of migratory songbirds in Asia uh, and tracks them as they move through the boreal, temperate and tropical ecosystems of Asia. So lots of exciting work that Wilhelm is going to tell us today on the webinar. Uh, also with us here, Tong is going to tell us about some very exciting conservation initiatives that he has been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, for those of you who know, Tung Tung is one of the most vocal voices for migratory land birds in Asia. And I've worked with him for many, many years, trying to raise the profile of some of the most famous migratory birds, including one thing that you can see on Tung's screen right now, the, uh, the very well-known yellow-breasted bunting, thanks in part to the efforts of Tung and his colleagues in Hong Kong. Uh, before we start our webinar, I just wanted to give everybody here on the uh, webinar a really broad overview of some of the work we do in bird life to protect migratory birds in Asia. And I'm now going to take you on a really quick uh, run through uh, as I share my screen with you right now. So in bird life, we have the Global Flyway Program. It's a program that aims to protect migratory birds throughout the world's major migratory flyways. Uh, a lot of migratory birds share common flyways and we compartmentalize and focus our efforts on each flyways, trying to deliver the kinds of actions that migratory birds need to be, for them to be better protected on their journeys. Uh, under our Global Flyways program, uh, we try to do several things, uh, including focusing our efforts on certain threatened migratory species, uh, some of which you guys know very um, much about things like the spoon-billed sandpiper uh, in Asia, uh, the Far Eastern curlew and the yellow-breasted bunting. Through the Global Flyways Program, we also work to identify networks of flight that we need to invest our conservation resources on. Uh, through the Flyways Program, we work to put in the policies uh, that would benefit migratory birds. And through that, we can use that as platforms to work closely with our colleagues in government to drive the conserv conservation actions that our migratory birds need in this part of the world. Uh, one of the uh, documents that guide our engagement on migratory bird conservation is the strategy that we've came out with um, in the last few years. This strategy, we call it the East Asian Australian Flyway Strategy, is really built upon uh, close consultation with many of our partners in Asia. Uh, through these consultations, we understand what are the, the priorities that uh, different partners we have in, bird, in the bird life partnership wants to work on, on migratory species in Asia. Uh, at the same time, we can also use these consultations to identify uh, conservation issues that are shared by different partners and how we can work together you know, to synergize how we uh, spend our resources on conservation. The, the uh, strategy also provides broad guidance on how we 
work on a bunch of cross-cutting uh, national level and quite big actions uh, that are out there for us to protect migratory birds. But uh, that said, I, I like to emphasize the fact that the strategy that we have in place is also a living document, so to speak. It is basically an ongoing process. We constantly try to reach out to our partners, to understand what's the latest situation on the ground and how we can adapt our actions to best protect migratory birds as per the emerging signs uh, that we get from our colleagues in academia. Uh, together, the BirdLife Partnership put together a pretty impressive toolbox of uh, different actions and strategies to deal with migratory bird conservation. We uh, do this through different approaches, including work to uh, expand our knowledge on migratory birds. Uh, we work on the ground with the folks that run the nature reserve. We work on the ground with conservationists to better manage the places that migratory birds use. Uh, and at the same time, through all these work that we do, we work uh, to promote awareness, to get people uh, more interested in migratory birds through uh, awareness programs and educational programs in the region. But last but not least, we also work closely with our colleagues to ensure that the policies that are there to protect our migratory birds have the profile that they deserve. In Asia, we have identified five major themes in the work we do for migratory birds. Uh, Top on the line is our work on coastal wetlands. Uh, coastal wetlands, as we all know here, are in trouble all over the continent. Um, many of our most important coastal wetlands are being lost to development, and we are working hard with our partners to make sure that these coastal wetlands are protected. Um, in Southeast Asia especially, we are also working closely with our partners to uh, better understand the situation of how many of our bird life is being hunted by people and how we can work closely with local communities to strengthen our engagement with them and to get them to work with us to protect birds and to explore alternative livelihoods uh, as well as to mitigate bird hunting pressures uh, around this region. Emerging themes that we are seeing for migratory birds in Asia include uh, how energy infrastructure uh, can affect migratory birds on their migratory routes. Uh, we are working closely with many stakeholders to raise the profile of this issue. Uh, and last but not least, we are also working very closely with our partners to better understand um, how migratory land birds, especially, uh, and freshwater wetlands in Southeast Asia are impacted by men, and how we can deliver the resources and the action to protect uh, two of these emerging conservation issues we have here in Southeast Asia. Uh, in implementation, uh, we work closely as a team. We've got an EAAF coordination team, which brings together all the expertise that we have from the country. Uh, and through this team, we work with our colleagues in other organizations. Uh, Ping Li, you have a microphone. Okay. Uh, to bring all these um, expertise together to better protect migratory birds. So here we have our coordination team, which uh, has nicely put together today's webinar to bring uh, to your attention some of these most pressing issues for migratory birds in Asia. A few quick conservation updates before we go into the presentation proper. Uh, but We've been seeing lots of exciting developments for migratory bird conservation in Southeast Asia in the last couple of years. Uh, for those of you who follow some of these developments, you are aware that we've got um, new initiatives for migratory birds in Southeast Asia. We've got new reserves. Recently, our partner in Thailand uh, presented the first ever private nature reserve for shorebirds in the Gulf of Thailand. And this is the first ever uh, achievement for the region, and we hope that we can see more of this in the future. Our partner in Myanmar has worked hard with the government to uh, promote Ramsar site in this very important area of wetlands called the Gulf of Motama. And this, as many of you would know, is the key habitat for the spoonbill sandpiper uh, on their migrations in Southeast Asia. Um, as you can see here on this piece of news that I picked up. Uh, but more importantly, we are working cl closely with our partners on the ground to raise the profile of how hunting is affecting our bird species in Southeast Asia. We've already finished a huge parcel of work to better understand this problem in six countries con uh, concurrently. And we hope to present these results in the coming months uh, and bring that awareness to policymakers so that we can work closely with them to deal with the problem of uh, bird hunting. So um, with that, I, I, I've covered quite a bit about the conservation work we do at BirdLife. Um, and I know many of you are very excited to hear about some of the, the research work that Wheelan has done. And without uh, any further delay, I will now pass the floor uh, onward to Wheelan to bring you to the heart of our theme for today's uh, presentation on 
migratory songbirds in Asia. Uh, with that, uh, over to you, Willen. Yeah, thank you very much, Ding Li. Really happy to see that so many of you are here today and to, to listen to my talk. Ding Li already uh, mentioned a lot about um, Asian migratory land birds, so I will um, keep my introduction rather short. Most important um, for me and maybe for all of you is that birds are beautiful in the first place. So Asia is home to so many astonishingly beautiful birds, such as this Siberian ruby throat. And of course, there always comes this question up of where these birds are going to and how they spend their year. And unfortunately for East Asian land birds, there's a lack of knowledge, especially regarding their migration patterns. So this is from a review published some years ago. And you see by that time, there were quite many studies investigating migration routes of birds moving between Europe and Africa and for birds moving between the Americas, but very little evidence for bird migration within Asia. And this is unfortunate, I think, because the East Asian flyway connecting northern Eurasia with Southeast Asia actually harbors the highest numbers of migratory land bird species and including the highest number of threatened land bird species. This is my pet group of songbird species in Asia. This is the Bunting's highly diverse group, but unfortunately, many of these species are obviously threatened. So recent studies have found that populations of the yellow-breasted buntings have declined by more than 90% within only 30 years. So now this species is considered as critically endangered on the iris in red list. We also found that populations of the rustic bunting declined by about 80% in the same period. And this species is now considered vulnerable. However, there are many more species of East Asian land bird migrants for which only very limited data on population trends is available. However, more and more papers are emerging, such as this very recent studies from colleagues from Korea, showing that also other species of bunting and other species of land birds are declining. Like for example, the elegant bunting and meadow bunting in Korea. Unfortunately, for most of the species, very little is known about potential threats about the distribution. So most of the species are still considered least concerned on the areas in red list, given that there is very little information. One of the most obvious possible threats already hi um, um, highlighted by Dingley is persecution. So the hunting for food or for the songbird trade or for religious purposes. And together with Ding League and colleagues, we um, started to collect information on which species are affected and about confiscation, about trade volumes of birds in Asia. And we found that actually 180 species are at least affected by some kind of persecution, so either for the songbird trade or for meat. So this is roughly 50% of all the migratory land bird species. We also found that single confiscation can number up to half a million individuals, and that it's very likely that many millions of individuals are taken from the wild every year. What you can see in this figure is the number um, of individuals found in our survey um, per bird group. And the most heavily affected group, at least in the surveys that we found or in the internet in the web information, are buntings with especially the yellow-breasted bunting. But there are many open questions that remain. So are those areas with known hunting pressure actually overlapping with migration corridors? So where are important stopover areas where birds are taken and where should conservation action take place? This is what I'm going to focus on the first part of my talk. And in the second part, I'm going to have a look at how we could answer parts of this question by using citizen science observation data. So recently, there has been an increase in tracking studies um, reviewed by Ding Li Yong and colleagues recently. And this is especially true for larger land birds, such as raptors. This can be easily explained as all larger land birds can be tracked with satellite tracking equipment, which gives us very precise um, positions and which is much easier to do because we don't have to recapture those birds. So these studies are still small land birds and especially songbirds, which is again unfortunate as songbirds are the most species group of East Asian land birds. However, they are too small to carry satellite transmitters for now. So one of the techniques available to get in some information about the migration of small land birds 
are geolocators. So those are not real tracking devices, so they do not connect with a satellite, but instead they only save information on ambient light levels together with a timestamp. Based on these light levels, we can then estimate sunrise and sunset for the position where the bird was present, and together with sunrise sunset, we can calculate day length, and from this, we can finally estimate longitude and latitude. However, as this depends on light levels, this is also depending on the kind of habitat where the bird is um, sitting and also on the behavior of a bird. So a bird sitting under closed canopy in the dense forest will produce very low light levels compared to a bird sitting on top of a tree. So this has to be kept in mind that this data from light level geolocators are only estimates and some of those estimates are pretty coarse. However, we started the, to tag yellow-breasted buntings with light-level geolocators, as these were the only method available um, to track the migration of this critically endangered bird. The critical thing is not only that the data is not as precise as with satellite tracking, but also that you have to recapture those birds with the data loggers one year after. So you have to find them, you have to recapture them to finally download the stored data. In the beginning, we managed to get three birds back with geolocators of the 19 yellow-breasted buntings tagged in the Russian Far East. And those blue lines are possible migration routes of those yellow-breasted buntings. And the blue crosses indicate um, positions where the birds were present for several days at least. The size of the crosses indicates the standard error around the position. So you can see that especially those positions during stopover in northern China are pretty coarse, so they are not really precise. We can estimate longitude quite well, but the latitudinal error is quite big, especially for positions during autumn when days are of equal length for large areas. However, still we can see that those three birds show a very similar migration pattern. They all started around um, August or early September from the Russian breeding grounds, migrated southwestward to China, where they spent up to three months at stop oversights. So they do not molt, they do not change their feathers at the breeding grounds, but instead fly to their stop over areas and change their feathers on stop over areas. So this is important to know, and this is also important for future conservation measures. By October, they continue to migrate, and then rather quickly, they all reach their breeding, uh, the wintering grounds or non-breeding grounds in Myanmar, rather close um, to each other. In the second step, we used all those information on trapping um, collected from other literature or from the internet to look if there is an overlap with areas of known trapping pressure and the possible migration routes of the yellow-breasted buntings. So those red crosses indicate sites where we have found information of illegal trapping of yellow-breasted buntings, whereas those orange and red dots indicate areas or sites where we know that yellow-breasted buntings were illegally traded or confiscated. And from this pattern, we could guess that there is a main migration corridor through northeast China, and this is also the bottleneck where most of the birds are trapped. Whereas most of the confiscation, most of the trade seems to be going on in the large cities of Peking and in southern China, especially in the Pearl River data, where yellow-breasted buntings are still illegally sold as a fancy dish for rich people. However, conservation action is in place and only this year, China has placed yellow-breasted bunting in the highest possible um, protection category of Chinese species. So it's a national protected species, and I'm quite optimistic that this will help to minimize the illegal capture of yellow-breasted buntings. However, our data on migration route was only based on three individuals. So this is a rather poor sample, and this might be coincidence that they all ended up in Myanmar for wintering. So we were looking for a data set much larger to infer patterns of non-breeding distribution. Unfortunately, there is rapidly increasing observation data available. So many citizen scientists, bird photographer, bird watcher, entered their data into eBird. If you do not so, please do, because this helps. Because we can download those data from eBird and use those observation data from people all over the world to model the distribution of birds. 
And we did so for the yellow-breasted buntings. So we compared the observation data, those presence records, with um, background variables, such as land cover type, altitude, water availability, um, temperature, and the vegetation index, so the greenness of vegetation at those sites, and compared it with other sites. And by doing this, um, we got the prediction for where yellow-breasted buntings are most likely present during different times of the year. And this is what we um, predicted with our species distribution model. You see those areas in red in northeast China are used exclusively during autumn migration in yellow-breasted bunting. So this is mainly the North China Plain, large flat areas, agricultural areas, which are obviously very important stopover areas because birds, as we know from geolocator tracking, spend there up to three months, so more time than on the breeding grounds. Whereas there is a large overlap in wintering and spring staging areas. So you see the blue and yellow colors, they largely overlap in Southeast Asia, also mainly in lowlands. And this means that birds are obviously staying rather long on their spring stop um, wintering sites and have a very fast spring migration to reach the um, breeding grounds without longer stopovers. However, this is only a model and we tried to validate these models with the data that we actually have. So with our geolocator tracks and with ring recoveries depicted here as dashed lines. And for the wintering season, so for the non-breeding season, the northern winter, we found that there is actually quite a good overlap. So all of our geolocator or ring recovery positions are within the predicted winter range of the species. However, during autumn migration, many of our positions were outside of the predicted range. There are two possible explanations for this. Either, as mentioned before, our geolocator positions are not as precise, and we therefore have this error, and our positions might be inside the predicted range. It's just the, the limits of this geolocator method, or our models are poor, and we didn't have observation data from the um, complete variety of habitats used during migration. So there's always the chance when using citizen science observation data that you get more data from densely populated areas or areas easily reached by people. We did correct in our models, but still we can't exclude that this might be a reason that we didn't um, completely cover all the possible stopover habitats and therefore our models might be biased. However, we did this not only for one species, the yellow-breasted bunting, but for all Asian land bird species for which geolocator tracks and ringing recoveries were available to validate those predictions. And to sum it up, we found that citizen science-based models were quite useful to predict um, the distribution for periods of residency, so especially for those long um, periods of the northern winter, those non-breeding periods, we got quite good um, overlap of positions and the predictions, but our models were of limited accuracy for periods of stopover and migration, where birds are obviously using a much broader range of habitats. The data set collected on ringing data and geolocation data also allowed us to look into migratory connectivity for the first time in Asian land birds. And I give you two examples. One is again the yellow-breasted bunting, the picture that we've already seen. We see that birds breeding from um, breeding in Yakutia, so northern Russia, and also in Finland, even outside the map to the west, are wintering in the same area in Thailand, very close to those birds from the Russian Far East tracked with geolocators. And we also see that one bird ringed on Kamchatka during breeding season spent um, the autumn at the same spot more or less as a bird from the Russian Far East. So we can say that most likely many yellow-breasted bunting populations migrate through the same migration corridor. So they meet during migration and they meet on the wintering sites. And this is what we could, would consider as low migratory connectivity. On the other hand, I give you a second example. This is the Siberian Rubis Road. And on the Western population, this is again the Russian Far East, you can see that all those birds tracked with geolocators from the Russian Far East migrated through China and spent the winter in Southeast Asia. Based on ringing recoveries, we can say that birds breeding farther east, so on Kamchatka or Sakhalin Island in easternmost Asia, they spent the winter on the Philippines or Taiwan migrating through Japan. 
So it seems in the Siberian Rubies Road, there are two distinct routes and birds from the easternmost populations would not meet with the western moor breeders during migration or on wintering. So this is what we would consider strong migratory connectivity. And of course, this also has strong conservation implications. If trapping is very um, strong illegal trapping at one side, for example, Northeast China for the yellow-breasted bunting, a huge part of the population will be affected. So maybe because all of the breeding populations migrate to this area. Whereas in the Siberian ruby throat, trapping, unsustainable trapping at one side would only affect one small part of the breeding population. So it wouldn't affect all um, ruby throat breeding populations. And this might be an explanation why the yellow-breasted bunting is now considered critically endangered because of its declining population, whereas the Siberian rubies road that we know is also heavily trapped for consumption and for the songbird trade is not as steeply declining so far and is still listed as least concern. However, we are still only in the beginning of understanding how um, migratory connectivity in East Asian land birds is um, shaped. So putting all the available tracks together that we have so far from our studies in the Russian Far East and from the pioneering work of colleagues from Japan, there seem to be two main patterns for migration of East Asian land birds. Birds breeding in mainland Russia migrate through mainland China and spend the winter on mainland Southeast Asia. Whereas birds breeding on the Japanese islands migrate to chains of islands in the Pacific and spend the winter on the Philippines or in Indonesia. There are some birds um, like the stone jets, which jump through the mainland from Japan and then migrate along the mainland route, similar to the birds from the Russian Far East. So a very nice pattern, but of course in nature, nothing is as easy as this. This is a track of a blue and white flycatcher, also breeding in the Russian Far East and also starting to migrate to the Chinese mainland. But then this bird made an unexpected move and spent the winter on Mindoro Island in the Philippines. So a very different pattern compared to all the other species that we had tracked so far. And this highlights the importance of tracking more species because there are much more patterns, most likely um, hidden within those diversity of species. On top of that, not all species are limited to spend the winter on the, in Southeast Asia or Indonesia. Some species of land birds breeding in Asia even go farther and can reach Australia, as shown by two very recent studies on swifts. So white-throated needle tails breeding in Japan and Pacific swift breeding on Sakhalin Island in Russia were recently shown to migrate all the way down to Australia. So rather similar to um, waders, which has not been documented for land birds so far. So there are still amazing discoveries to be made when tracking little known East Asian land birds. However, there is not only interesting patterns if you look at different species, but also within species. So we started to work on different populations of Siberian rubies roads and yellow pested buntings along a longitudinal gradient all over Russia. And this is what I would like to show you now. So this is not published so far. This is very recent data collected during the past years. In orange, you see the tracks of yellow breasted buntings. And in red, this is the estimated tracks for ruby throats. They all spend the winter in Southeast Asia. And, but there, there are some interesting aspects which I would like to highlight during their migration. First, the yellow-breasted buntings. So what you can see here is this, even those birds breeding at Lake Baikal first make this eastward movement and then migrate along the same migration corridor and use similar stop oversights like the birds from the Russian Far East. So this is confirming again our hypothesis or our assumption that yellow-breasted buntings have very low migratory connectivity and that they all migrate to the same corridor, which might be an explanation why this species declined very strongly within a very short time. For the rubies route, we also see that the westernmost breeders, like this bird from Ural, migrates eastward first. But they turn southward, not as far east as the yellow-breasted buntings. So they have a very distinct route from breeders in the Russian Far East, as they migrate southward further west. So they wouldn't meet with the Russian um, Far East birds. 
And if you look at the wintering grounds, you also see that those birds breeding in Siberia and in the Ural Mountains, European part of Russia, they also spend the winter further west than those eastern breeders. So you can see that some birds even reached India during um, winter. And this confirms again that there is strong migratory connectivity in the Siberian Rubes Road, which might be a buffer against like um, unsustainable trapping at one site. However, there are still many important knowledge gaps to allow effective conservation measures of Asian land birds. And this is still the distribution during the non-breeding season. Even if we get some ideas about migration patterns from geolocators, we still know very little about the habitats they use during migration at stop oversights, the time they spend there, and whether habitat loss could be another important factor which we didn't um, understood so far. Another important aspect which will be very um, crucial to, to tackle conservation issues in Asia will be to get a range-wide population trends of East Asian land birds. More and more local studies are emerging and it will be a very important task to compile all these data sets to get a better understanding and to prioritize conservation actions. And if we know population trends from different areas and if we can link those to different changes of land cover or trapping intensities in different parts of Asia, we will finally be able to understand species specific threats and therefore tailored conservation measures will be possible. With this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I also want to thank you all my, um, thank my collaborators, especially uh, my colleagues in Russia, with whom I'm working since 10 years now, all the students which helped me during the field work, my colleagues at the University of Copenhagen and the Swiss Ornithological Institute, which supported those geolocator tracking studies and all the numerous funders which supported our work in Asia. Thank you. Maybe a last slide to highlight a very recent paper um, led by Ding Li Yong on the state of migratory land bird in the East Asian flyway. So this is a very important read summarizing the situation of land birds in Asia. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Wieland. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, and also many thanks for bringing to uh, our attention some of these important studies. Um, I noticed that many of the studies that you picked out for us came in as recently as in just a couple of months ago. So this is really uh, a fantastic set of updates for the audience. Um, I really enjoy your presentation and I, I like the fact that you drew uh, a lot of our attention, you know, to the fact that science, um, the kind of research that you uh, people like you are doing on the ground uh, is, you know, helping us to build that knowledge, that evidence base that helps us to make conservation more efficient, make conservation uh, matter more at the places where it's most important. Um, the fact that you pointed out, you know, why we need to track birds, um, that hopefully comes through very clearly to a lot of our friends who are on this call uh, to see that uh, tracking is important because uh, first and foremost, very little of that has been done in Asia and uh, the new grounds that you and your colleagues are doing is really helping us to bridge um, knowledge gaps that have been there for a long time. So thanks for bringing us through a, a whirlwind odyssey of the exciting work on uh, migratory land birds that you have done. Uh, and also one final point, you pointed out the importance of citizen science. And this is where many of our colleagues on the call who are very active bird watchers around Asia, um, they have a role to play in conservation by, by submitting their data to eBird and to other bird watching platforms where people like uh, you and other researchers can gather that and crunch numbers to tell us what is important for conservationists like uh, myself and uh, Tung, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about his work soon. So uh, I will now pass um, the floor to my colleague Tung. Uh, Tung, as uh, we've, uh, we've talked about earlier on, is a very, very energetic, very dynamic conservationist based in Hong Kong. And uh, he's been one of those people telling people that we need to care about our land birds. So I want him now to uh, spend a bit of his time to tell us what he's been up to recently, uh, some of the exciting developments that he's been pursuing and uh, also demonstrating and building on what Wieland has presented earlier on, on science and those links with conservation. So over to you, Tung. Thank you very much, Tung Li, and also thank you very much to Wieland. And uh, we are now talking about, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the, some uh, sample study or sample uh, some works in Hong Kong, uh, which is actually inspired by uh, Will and other colleagues working on the Bunteng and other uh, land in East Asia. 
So uh, I just don't need to talk too much about how rare or how difficult for the for the for the uh, of the buntings in this area. Uh, but now we all know uh, we have some ur we need some urgent action to see how uh, what we could do for the birds. Uh, so in Hong Kong, after we know all this information about uh, how rare or how uh, how highly risk of the bunting they could, and then we just start to uh, to do some uh, very specific program of bird banding uh, on the bunting uh, since the uh, autumn uh, 2017. So um, well, very very simple basic work. I think we we need to collect the uh, the very basic information. Uh, how many buntings could pass over Hong Kong uh, in the auction time? So we just go to the, the best sites of the buntings in Hong Kong, and then we uh, set up the mist net, and then we try to trap as much as possible, as many as possible, and then put on some color uh, engraved colorings on the on the bunting, uh, particularly the yellow breasted bunting. So we could have uh, some uh, population estimate on the on how many individuals uh, of the yellow breasted bunting uh, go through Hong Kong. So um, yeah, uh, we also encourage uh, bird watchers uh, to, to submit uh, the uh, observation records of those banded individuals to us. Uh, so just I give you a just a table of this uh, uh, of the summary of how many birds we we caught uh, in this year. So you will see uh, we caught uh, not many. I mean, compared to the uh, 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 the population or compared to the uh, the individuals are caught in other other places. We don't have many, we don't have a very high number. I mean, thousands of birds, we, we don't. We just have a few tens or sometimes a hundred birds uh, we could caught in Hong Kong or in, um, in the autumn time. But it is a very important fundamental information for us. When we are now talking about how, uh, why we need to protect the place, uh, now we also need to pass, uh, to, to pass the message about the conservation of yellow breast hunting to the Hong Kong public. We always use this kind of figure because we can tell them and um, critically endangered species uh, could come to Hong Kong in what how in how many birds. So yeah, this is very uh, good for us uh, to do uh, uh, our works in, uh, in in the conservation of the site and also about the, the species. Yes, uh, you could imagine uh, when we do all this kind of the uh, trapping, ringing, and then uh, put on the the uh, the, the colorings, uh, the engraved engraved rings on the birds. So we could also expect people to take photos of the birds and or some observation of the birds. So we can know how many birds uh, were still around and how many uh, how many how how much time they spend on it. So. Um, yeah, we have this kind of, we start to collect this kind of information, but I still, I can still tell you, uh, we don't have uh, too many uh, recycling so far. Uh, all this individual, uh, all this information, uh, all this in, in information here, uh, you will see, yes, uh, we, the birds approximately stay in Hong Kong for about a week, and then, yeah, all this kind of uh, information. Uh, we still need more, we still need more. And also, um, you could also pick up here and, we still have, haven't have any reciting or re recapture of the Hong Kong uh, engraved ring uh, so far from the overseas. So, uh, wow, you could imagine, uh, we just caught uh, a few tens of birds in every year. Uh, then from the, uh, we don't have many obs observer in this region as well. So I, well, in the beginning, I don't expect uh, it could be easy to find, uh, uh, to, re to, to have some reciting of this kind of birds, but we all know that we must keep working on it. One day we will have some information, and then if we haven't started, yeah, we just never know what we could what we could have. So we just keep working on it uh, with the uh, banding and using the coloring for the for the for the zero breast banding and also other banding as well. And then we also uh, need to do a little bit more on the um, promotion. So uh, we call people to count the banding, but I can also tell you uh, the information they they submit to us. Uh, would not be that very uh, systematic. So we, yeah, we, we call people to do it, but we know it is more or less like the um, promotion or awareness program for the bunting. Uh, so we just hope more people could uh, make aware of this. And then when they know what is bunting and then they could find something, okay, okay, this bird has a coloring, they will submit the record for us. That is the way we do the, uh, the, uh, the groundwork about the conservation of this, of this species. And also, we are the part of the international uh, zero breast bunting ringing program as well. So uh, now uh, we have uh, different teams working in different places using different colors to identify the uh, different uh, in, uh, populations. 
So we have a little bit more information here. You know, um, Mongolia, uh, Russia could use the uh, different combination of the colorings. Mostly, uh, they have one one main color for the countries. Uh, but uh, then uh, now, even in Thailand, they start to uh, to do to join us in this program as well. So we also need to promote uh, this material and then to let the people know when they could have a uh, reciting of uh, any, any color ring, uh, yellow, yellow vegetable bunting, they could know where they could, re uh, they could report to. Okay, if I got the first uh, engraved yellow, yellow ring, this is from Hong Kong, and then they should tell the Hong Kong researcher or the purple one, they could go to uh, report to the Russian researcher, something like that. So um, we definitely need to more, uh, yeah, when we want, if we want more, if you want to know more information about the yellow best different thing about the migration route, a stop over site, and then the duration of the migration, all this kind of information. Uh, apart from what we learn do, we also need to do this kind of the uh, very basic uh, fundamental uh, field research on the bunting. So I hope more people can join us to go to find the buntings, particularly about the coloring the buntings. So they can tell us where, uh, where the birds are, something like that. Uh, yes, tracking study is definitely uh, inspired by uh, Wheelan's study as well. So uh, Wheelan's already mentioned it, so I just don't need, don't need to tell uh, all the details. So uh, Russia and Mongolia has already started the program, uh, the tracking study. Uh, so we hope we can do more and then we collect more information. And then so we can know how to, uh, where the best go. And then just as Wheelan say, uh, we just try to discover, uh, try to discover more unknown uh, information about the uh, bunting and other land as well. So from here, I just try to uh, give you a little bit more ideas about what we could do on land as well. Uh, so for the in the in the coming slides, uh, there could be many words and many information, but I just try to make it as simple as possible. So in Hong Kong, we also do the uh, territory-wise uh, 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 bird survey. So uh, we could record all the land birds uh, in Hong Kong as well. Uh, okay, from here, I just want, uh, I need to tell you that uh, we also do the, uh, the survey in the winter time. This is one important thing. And then we could know, and then we also have uh, the similar type uh, of study have been done about 10 years ago. So now we uh, repeat it again. So we can check the result from the previous study and this and this current uh, and this current study, and then we can tell you um, the uh, the comparison of the result of some species that would be very interesting. So from here, you could imagine that you could imagine that when you have uh, two um, when you have the two studies that uh, you will see if some study could have an increasing trend and then some will be have a, a single uh, decreasing trend. So from here, I just want to tell you, uh, for the on the bottom, on the bottom four species, uh, they are all migrants. But we have also noticed that they have a declining trend uh, of, of these uh, migratory species, migratory land species, land bird species, uh, over the past ten years in Hong Kong. That is something I think I need to share with you tonight. Uh, one example. Uh, this is a common map, I think many people know. Uh, even in Hong Kong, such a common bird, we already find uh, the common map, uh, the, orient the oriental map has a de uh, declining uh, 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 distribution in Hong Kong as well. And then the other thing is uh, Richard's pivot as well. Uh, this is uh, also the other alarming uh, uh, result for me uh, because we think, oh, Richard's pivot is a really plain bird, very non attractive bird. Uh, this should be no problem from the hunting or from the from other collection uh, from the from the collector, but now you see uh, it may come from the habitat as well. Uh, if they, they if their habitats are lost and then the richest people will, will not come to uh, the uh, the place uh, like the Hong Kong, so that is something uh, we are uh, now very worrying about that. Uh, in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a very small small place. Uh, habitat can change a lot. But also, uh, we now we have, uh, and, and then the other, the other uh, question we need to think about is about the climate change. Uh, I just mentioned it uh, in the a few, few slides uh, before. Uh, we noticed that red fan blue tail is one of the species uh, with the de uh, declining trend. Uh, that is quite uh, um, uh, surprise to me because this species has been very common in Hong Kong. Uh, also, uh, red fan blue tail could sometimes have a poor winter 
uh, in Hong Kong. And then usually we could have a better winter or even a good winter uh, following the, the, the bad one. But now uh, from this study, we already spent three winters uh, for, to cover all the sites in Hong Kong. Uh, in all three winters, we combine all the data together. We find the red bamboo cell actually is quite rare in the past three winters already. So we, I think we need to make notice about that uh, because the forest is better and better in Hong Kong, but the forest bird, one of these forest birds, uh, the red bamboo cell, uh, could not have this kind of trend. So we think it may have some problem of the land bird. That is something going back to the main theme tonight. So when we do about, when we talk about uh, the land bird, uh, conservation or the land bird migration, we just know very little about it. Uh, we may actually losing some species and then we need uh, more study and need more people to make concern or uh, to make awareness about it and then make sure we are not, we, we are not too late to do some conservation of some certain declining flattened species. So I think, yeah, that is my short presentation today and I hope uh, you could, uh, yeah, we, we sh I share that what we do on ground with you. So I hope uh, we could have more discussion later as well, following as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tung, for that very enlightening presentation of the, of the groundwork that you're doing in Hong Kong. I think um, uh, a lot of the work that you, you as you have mentioned, is, is very important, especially in terms of reaching out to people and getting the public interested in land birds. Um, I think we all agree that um, not a lot of uh, people out there are aware, you know, of the conservation issues facing land birds. Um, and people like you, uh, like Whelan, are working very hard, keeping ourselves busy, trying to promote this uh, awareness uh, so as to get more people to be interested in looking out for land birds. Uh, for those of you guys out there who are bird watchers in East Asia, uh, as Tung has mentioned, look out for yellow-breasted buntings, especially when you see color rings. The color rings tell you something about where they were banded. And if you see any of these yellow-breasted buntings, the ring, uh, report them to the uh, local bird watching or bird research authorities. That information is very important because it tells us a lot about where these birds are migrating from, which will help us in their conservation. So thanks once again, Tung, for bringing us through that. Uh, and also, I forgot to mention that uh, you've gone into the, the Bird Atlas of Hong Kong project. This is a very inspiring project whereby you've managed to pull a lot of people together to do surveys at very fine grids for the whole year through the seasons. I think that's a very inspiring piece of work. Uh, but at the same time, the conservation value of this kind of work is, uh, is really out there because it gives people who are making the policies the big picture of what are these changes going on and what our what are the, the the management approach we should take into consideration when we when we protect our forests and our agricultural land for land birds so um Thanks once again, and I'm also mindful of the fact that there's a there's a steady accumulation of questions in the in the Q and A box. Uh, a lot of good questions for Wieland and for for Tung as well. Okay, so uh, I'll ask the question to Wieland. Wieland, what is the known what is known of the westernmost yellow-breasted buntings? Do they also turn east around to the Himalaya? Is a question from Gottlieb from I think Switzerland. Thank you for these excellent questions. Um... Of course, this would be the most interesting populations, those westernmost breeders in European Russia. Those are also the populations which are now almost extinct, so where population declines were strongest. And we did put geolocators on birds on those um, populations in the western part of the range, but unfortunately, return rates are close to zero. So we didn't get any of the data loggers back so far. So it seems the survival rates of those birds in the west of the range is lower compared to birds breeding further east. So either it's survival or um, site fidelity, we do not know for sure now, but since we are limited um, to the method of geolocators, we do need to rely on birds coming back, which wasn't the, um, the case so far. But if you would ask me for my personal opinion, I would say, yes, I think they all migrate this very long eastward way to um, Eastern Asia and then use the same migration corridor just as those breeds breeding in the Russian Far East. And the reason for their decline might be that they are very limited in time. So they have to cover a three or four times the, the root of those birds breeding in the East. So they have very little time for breeding on the breeding grounds, even less than those birds um, breeding in the Russian Far East. So there might be additional factors that add on, on this um, survival um, 
problem caused by unsustainable trapping. I hope this would answer your question. I think that was very comprehensive, Wieland. Thanks for bringing <laughs> us through the. Uh, I, I mean, I, I as until you came out these studies, I had no idea how yellow-breasted buntings connect the uh, breeding grounds in the far west to the to tropical Asia. So, um, lots of uh, exciting advances in science uh, for us for land birds. There's a question here that I thought was quite interesting, and I think both Tung and Wieland would have some uh, great insights on that. Uh, there's a question from Jeff Bueller, and Jeff has asked. Uh, can you elaborate on any migration bottlenecks that you have been uh, able to identify to highlight important stopover areas for species? So I think I think what Jeff is saying is that uh, are there uh, particular areas in East Asia where a lot a lot of migratory land birds have to pass through, um, and maybe these could be good places for bird watching even. So maybe Tung, you want to take on this question first, and then over to Willen. Yeah, uh, I just uh, make it very simple because I think uh, Williams already got the answer. Um, so his uh, Williams studies already show the uh, the place with the cross uh, on the uh, uh, the uh, pay, uh, Beijing area would be very good. That is a white, one of the well known sites. But I just want to uh, uh, emphasize that I would say I would say there's some other migratory hotspot has not been well documented in China. Because when I go through some uh, Chinese uh, uh, ornithological records, it really tells some horse, uh, some spot could be quite good for uh, actually for hunting, uh, it, particularly those uh, the, uh, the hunting at night. Uh, when they light up uh, some flyer, uh, some fly, and then the migrants uh, would be attracted by the, by the fire, as well, by, by the torch already. Um, I know one of two, one of two uh, places in Yunnan and in uh, Jiangxi could have this kind of the, uh, situation. So I would expect that this, that place would be very, very good for the migrant as well. Uh, but the problem is that uh, I don't see any uh, good literature has been documented this kind of the uh, observation. So yes, one of the thing uh, we need to do is we need to find, find this thing out, uh, find the information uh, first. So yeah, uh, to you, Willen, as well. Thank yep, you. Over to you, Willen. Yep. Yeah, thank you. I fully agree with Tung. So, the obvious places, especially when considering yellow-breasted buntings, are the, the North China plains in the east of China, where many birds from many populations are gathering. And these places are already known by bird watchers that birds migrate along the, the East China coast and gather in high numbers. But if you look at the tracks of the Rubies Road, you see that they also migrate to Western parts of China, where very few bird watchers are active. And I think there are several spots which are quite interesting and where migration corridors can be expected. But with our geolocation data, it's rather hard to really pinpoint exact locations. So we can more give an estimate about the regions. I also want to highlight at this point that there are some very um, excellent studies about migration, especially in mountains of, of southern China by Chinese colleagues who are catching and ringing birds at night using light to, to trap them. So there is already some evidence that um, also migration goes on through mountain ranges in southern China in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. So there is still a lot to discover, especially I yeah. think in, in the western part of China where population density and observer density is much lower. Thanks for that, Wieland. And actually, uh, while you were mentioning this, I actually have one question myself. Um, and I think both you and Tung could take on the question as well. Um, so for a lot of our friends on the call who are bird watchers, I, I remember, you know, back in the days, you have this very famous site called Bei Dai He in uh, northern China. You know, a lot of bird watchers go there to look at migrants. Do you find that any of the birds that you have tracked uh, or based on the, the latest um, publications. Um, is there still a lot going on in Beidaiha nowadays, um, just that we are not going there to see it? What are your thoughts on, on this site? Yeah, you first. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, we do have a, a ring recovery of a bird um, ringed at our site in the Russian Far East, which was recaptured near Beidaiha. So obviously, some birds are uh, going through there. So there is a direct connection um, uh, okay. with a rustic bunting ringed at Moriovka Park. And we can also guess that some of our birds um, tagged with geolocators might have um, chosen a stop oversight close to by the hair. So both yellow pressed bunting more or less and but more likely um, Siberian ruby roads. I just did supplement uh, a little bit about the site. Uh, by the hair is uh, still uh, is a very good site for uh, watching migrants. And also it is quite well known as well. 
and then uh, I already I actually have uh, sometimes talking to the other bird watching friends in China. They actually worry about the site because uh, they find uh, they think uh, Beidaihe or the area around Beidaihe actually has been uh, destroyed or degraded uh, 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 actually quite a lot because of the um, economic development. Uh, so yes, we uh, they they cannot have any good information about how. Uh, the, the numbers of the birds going up or going down. They don't have this kind of the uh, systematic survey, but they worry about uh, the, the future of the site. So I think, uh, yeah, we need to put our eyes on it as well. Mm, good. I think when, when the dust from this pandemic is settled, we should go back then to, to look out for migratory birds, uh, you know, and see what the situation there is like. Um, there's a question I think uh, I noticed just uh, for Whelan, I think. Uh, Whelan has uh, there's a question from Charles Harper, and Charles is uh, keen to hear your your views on how reliable you think the eBird records are for many bird species. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. This is always um, of concern, um, the data quality for for a citizen science projects. But I would say yes, they are reliable. There are outliers, of course. There will be wrong points. There will be birds which have been misidentified. But given the sheer number of points these outliers um, doesn't really matter. So we have thousands of observations of yellow-breasted buntings. And if there are 10 which actually refer to a different species, they won't really matter for our predictions. So I would say eBird provides very good data. There might be wrong information. We won't get rid of this, even with a denser network of eBird reviewers. But in the end, if the data sets are really huge, it doesn't matter. So the more good data there is in the database, the less we will have to care for those outliers or misidentifications. Mm, I think that's a very good point, which is to say that for those of you who are bird watchers, keep submitting your eBird data um, because it, like as Willen says, um, the, the impact of those problematic records have not so much uh, influence on the, the bigger data set as a whole. Uh, and Tung, do you have any thoughts on this as well? Uh, uh, not not on that question. Uh, uh, so okay. I mean, we, we already make a very good one. Another really good question that I think uh, is really a recipe for some more good discussions. Um, there's a question from Vivekanan, uh, our colleague, uh, who asked uh, whether if human interactions uh, affect does human. Uh, what I think uh, Vivekanan is saying is that uh, does the way human beings change the environment does that affect the migratory routes of these birds? Um, any insights from you, Whelan and Tung? Okay, I, I may start. So this is a very yep, go for it. Yeah. A, a question and a, a rather broad topic. Mm -hmm. um, of course, birds do have the, response, uh, the, the possibility to respond to changing conditions. But the problem is with the species I'm working with, so most of the songbirds, they are rather short-lived and they completely rely on their innate instincts for migration. So they do not learn from the parents where is the best and safest route and they often have a short lifespan. So there is not much time to learn for a bird to avoid, for example, certain trapping hotspots. So those um, songbird migrants, they migrate, especially in the first year, only vector-based. So they have a, this innate genetic program. They know their direction and they know the number of days they have to follow this route and they can't really um, yeah, learn. So this is more for, for larger bird species such as cranes or geese, which migrate as a family and which have this traditional migration knowledge given from one bird to the other, that they have a chance to adapt to, to changing conditions. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, birds are known to respond to changes, for example, in habitat availability and climate, um, for example, due to, to global change. So there is evidence that birds are learning and that this is not true, actually not true learning, but this is true um, evolution. Yeah. So those birds which will stop over in unsuitable areas will simply die and will not return and will therefore not give their genes to the next generation. So, but yes, maybe you, you intended your question more focusing on, for example, unsustainable trapping. So birds might learn to avoid those areas where illegal trapping is rampant. This would be nice, but unfortunately, there is very little scope for, for learning this as this um, process of evolution is rather slow and it won't be um, in time to, to solve these problems. 
I, I think, yeah, Williams already covered uh, all, uh, the profiles of all the good points about that. And I, I totally agree. I just give a little bit more about my observation about the, uh, about the, the adapt adaptation of the lambers. So I just mentioned that when uh, we also do the misnetting in Hong Kong, Actually, we really find the birds actually could avoid the nets when they when they see the nets. So, uh, wow! When we talk about learning, maybe they have very short uh, memory of this kind of learning. That's it. But yeah, I think uh, most of all, uh, most of the uh, the concept or most of the uh, information just would be just like what William say. Yeah, I think yeah yeah yeah. You you make a very good point. They 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 just totally rely on their inborn yeah yeah uh, mem uh, mechanism or whatever yeah to do their, 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 their migration. Thanks for uh, both, uh, both your answers. I think that covered the question really thoroughly. Um, on another related question, there's another question coming just down from Francis Look, So uh, Francis, thank you guys for sharing your experiences. And uh, her question is um, about whether if uh, yourself, Tung, or yourself, Whelan, have you come across any um, unusual, odd, or unexpected changes contrary to what you thought of initially about the known migratory routes for any species that you have studied. Have you seen anything that um, went against what you initially thought you knew about the migratory route of any of these birds? Uh, maybe, uh, Tong, you want to take this question first? Uh, well, uh... Well, I would say that I would say that uh, when we have more study about land birds, we we actually find more uh, thing uh, unexpected as well. Well, one of the one of the uh, one of the sample uh, one of the example is that uh, we expect the birds could stay in Hong Kong uh, for about a week or or two uh, to stay there to recover their body uh, their body condition and then to do the migration. But now from our yeah rain study, we just Actually, it is very, very low recapture rate or actually very low reciting rate as well. So I think in the place in Hong Kong, the turnover is really, really high. That is out of our expectation. But yeah, we need, we need to really uh, find the answer from it. Thanks. And, and yourself, Willen, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, it's hard to say because to, to have an expectation and to see changes, we would need a, a background level. And for many species, nothing was known so far. So we can't really <laughs> compare and we, we can't see many changes in migratory movements, for example. So in 10 years on, we can say, <laughs> if we still continue to track Ruby's road, if, if there are changes going on, for example, related to climate change or to, mm. to habitat loss. And uh, Wieland, did you, um, are, are you expecting more and more studies on migratory passerines from Asia based on your conversations with colleagues? Will we be seeing more of these kinds of work coming up in the coming years? Yes, I know that many groups are working now with, with geolocators and I expect there will be much more um, publications in the coming years and I'm really looking forward to it. Good we are all keeping our fingers crossed yeah, because this is going to transform the way we think about land birds. Um, you know, in the past, I think whenever we look at the, the maps that show where the land birds go, we only broadly know where they breed and where they winter. But I think the emerging science is revolutionizing uh, everything in a very big way, right? You now know exactly the routes that these birds are taking. Uh, let's let's move on to the next question. There's quite a steady build up, built up of questions. The next question, I think, uh, would be something that both Whelan and Tung would be able to take on. The question is about uh, weather, weather and climate. So I've got one question here from uh, Derek Lim. Uh, Derek asks, do we have enough data to understand the effects of weather patterns and variations? So thinking about climate change uh, and their impacts on bird migration and bird migration timings. What are your thoughts on this question, uh, Willen? Maybe Willen would like to go first, then we go on to Tung. Yes, definitely. So there are studies from, I know from Japan, for example, where they could show that birds respond to warmer spring temperature and time their arrival earlier. So this is especially something known for, for short distance migrants, um, which are able to adapt rather quickly to, to climate change. However, in long distance migrants, which have to rely on conditions all along their route, um, usually we see rather um, little scope for, for earlier arrival. But most of the knowledge so far comes also from, from other flyways and for the East Asian flyways, um, 
there's still more more to come. So we're only scratching on the surface so far, but it's very likely that the pattern will be similar to other flyways and that birds will change their timing um, following climate change. Thanks. That was very comprehensive. And what about you, Tom? What do you think about uh, weather, climate uh, effects on, on bird migration? Uh, I would say uh, we, we still we still could not do anything good, uh, any good research in, in Hong Kong. And also Hong Kong is very small. Uh, it's just uh, somehow meaningless to, to study the climate change or the weather, just in very small place. But I would change it for, uh, for the other words. I just make one example. Uh, this spring is actually is one of the uh, driest spring in Hong Kong. Uh, we have uh, we have very difficult time uh, for bird watching in Hong Kong this spring. Uh, we don't find many migrants, uh, but it happened before. Uh, what I mean is that uh, we know that uh, when we have a dry spring, uh, we don't see any migrants. Uh, we don't easily see migrants uh, passing through Hong Kong, uh, uh, stop over in Hong Kong. I mean, uh, so we think uh, for in good weather, well, uh, this year is quite quite special because we have dry and windy uh, spring. Uh, we usually have a very uh, in spring. We usually have a lot of rain, and then uh, we don't have too many uh, rains as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we don't have too many wind, strong wind as well. Uh, strong wind come with the rain, and then uh, migrant uh, will stop in Hong Kong. That is usually we we expect it. But this, yeah, this this year uh, we have nothing like that. Uh, we just have a very high, a very windy day, dry day. So. Uh, yeah, this spring is not very good for, for birds. So when we talk about the climate change or the weather, I'm sure if they if this kind of system has been changed, uh, we will have fewer records of uh, some species. That is, yeah, our, our observation. I think that's a that's a very interesting observation, um, and it's really something that you guys could do because there are so many people out there looking at migratory birds. I also wanted to bring about a point from a discussion with our colleagues in Thailand. I think some of our colleagues are on the call as well. Uh, Philip Raum, are you one uh, who does a lot of uh, work on migratory birds in Thailand? They were saying that uh, uh, this year, at least based on their experiences, uh, studying the migratory birds on one of these small islands in the Gulf of Thailand. Uh, they noticed that the uh, the numbers of some of these species, which usually can get quite high in previous years, were really low this year. So um, we don't know exactly what what is going on, but uh, the pattern is unusual. And certainly, like what you say, uh, we need to uh, be more assiduous in collecting that data so that we can get a, a better sense of what is going on there. So um, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, uh, about the uh, the patterns that you're seeing in Hong Kong. Um, what about Wieland? Do you know that, uh, are you aware of any other situations in Asia, you know, especially from the current spring where the bird numbers have been a bit different from the past years? Are you seeing similar patterns, especially at the places that you work in? Um, I can only give my point of view from, from our fieldwork site in Russia. And there we had the feeling that weather only had an effect on like, on the days when when birds were migrating, but not on the on the actual numbers. So in a cold spring, birds would come a bit later, and on in the rainy days, you would get le less birds than on 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 dry days. But they would come later. So we we didn't have this these changes in overall occurrence at, at our site in Russia. Mm. So see. this might be something specific for for the southern part of the flyway. Mm, yeah, something interesting is going on. Yeah, and hopefully the data from next year will allow us to make some comparison to see whether this this anomaly makes sense. Uh, I I just spotted a question uh, on uh, yellow-breasted bunting from a colleague in Nepal. Uh, Ishana, uh, who many of us work with, uh, made a comment about yellow-breasted bunting. So she she said that uh, one of the yellow-breasted buntings that she's observed was on the sixth of May in Kathmandu. Um, she thinks that it, this is uh, obviously quite a, a late date for the bird to be in the in the wintering ground. Uh, do you think this a bird like this would reach their wintering uh, the breeding area on time? Any thoughts from Wieland and Tung? Yes, they can be extremely fast during spring migration. So we see this, for example, where we have better data in Siberian Ruby's roads that those birds breeding at higher latitudes or further to the west they spend much more time on the wintering grounds. So even Ruby's roads stay until um, late April on the wintering grounds where birds breeding in the Russian Far East already arrived at the breeding grounds. So they are already setting up their territories while 
individuals of the same species birding further north and further west are still down in Southeast Asia. So I'm quite optimistic that the bird in May in Kathmandu will likely reach its breeding ground in the beginning of June, where conditions will be starting to begin perfect in the northern part of the breeding range. From Hong Kong, we could, uh, we could still have uh, some late record of yellow breast hunting in about 23rd or 25th of May, passing through Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, actually not, not rare. Uh, yeah, we could, we could find the birds such late almost every, every, every year. So yeah, uh, early May in Kamandu, I think, yeah, it, could, it is not too late. <laughs> Can I ask a question, Ningling? Uh, yes, Baron, please uh, throw in a question as well. Yeah. Although I, I have a question as well. <laughs> yeah, but over to you first, Baron. Yeah. Okay. Um, Phil and, and Wieland, you are a specialist on when it comes to bird migration, and you rely heavily, well, heavily to some extent, heavily on the information collected by citizens. So through citizen science projects like eBird and also um, coloring birds, observations, etc. So what, what is it sort of, what would you like to see happen when it comes to birders around the world and especially in this flyway? How, how could they be of more value to you? What could they do? Should they visit remote places and then, or should they stay with their own patches and have a sort of constant effort? What, what, what would you advise? Um, any thoughts on that? Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, they could they could provide us with uh, good information. I think uh, for many this kind of the lambers because they're usually small in size and also not in the big flock like uh, those uh, waders or the cranes. Uh, usually, uh, they would not uh, record the information with the numbers. Uh, so, well, they find one bird. Okay, I find one bird. But now, if they could do, I think it is always better to record the number as well. Uh, they may think they may think that is somehow um, uh, just too patchy or too small. But I would say, uh, when they try, when we when everybody try to build uh, up this uh, data, uh, we will see something on it. And also, we also need to uh, have a database to collect all this kind of information to put all together. And then, yeah, we we know we know more. Dear bird watchers, please do submit your records. <laughs> so all your data is well. You will. Um, yeah. It doesn't need to be from remote places. It, all kind of data is, is valuable. When mm. um, more specifically regarding eBird, it's it's much more um, informative if you submit a complete species list instead of a single observation, because this also gives an information what species is missing. So complete species list uh, from the data perspective more interesting than, than single observations. And I would also recommend to look out for um, specific monitoring programs, such as organized by the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society. It's always important to to find people taking part in those organized surveys. So this is thing, a very important thing where bird watchers are, are crucial. I, I just wanted to make a quick comment and uh, bring on to another question that I just saw pop up on the <laughs> Q and A. There's a lot of questions, really. What I think that I think that is a good sign because there's a lot of interest from the audience uh, on land birds. Um, one of the challenges uh, that uh, that I, I wanted to highlight for migratory land birds, especially, is that a lot of these. Uh, bird watchers to come to Southeast Asia, they are always very attracted with the very colorful birds, you know, those trogon and hornbills. And I just feel, you know, as a Southeast Asia based bird, uh, that um, because of this uh, attention differences to different groups of birds, uh, we might be missing a lot on migratory land birds because a lot of our birds that reach us. Um, Indonesia and Western Malaysia, they tend to be drab warblers and flycatchers. They are not in the reading plumage. So, but but then again, that said, I, I think it's very important for people here in this region to look out for all these flycatchers, warblers, uh, robins, and all that, you know, because uh, only when we know uh, what they are doing in this part of the world where they are really little known, can we, you know, add that one important piece of the jigsaw puzzle to that bigger understanding of migratory birds. Uh, and I know that there's a comment from our colleague Jan Musica in Japan. Uh, Jan is a close colleague of us and uh, he was the one who produces fantastic photograph of the ruby throat that you saw on our banner. Uh, Jan's question is about migratory bird phenology. So um, I think both Tung and uh, Willem would be able to take on it. Uh, Jan's question is, uh, are your studies uncovering time differences in migration between the male birds and the female birds of the small passerines. 
I think uh, you surely have the answers for these, these, this question. Yeah. Do you want to go first, Wheeler? Yes, we have a paper out only published this this year in January in behavioral ecology and social biology, mm -hmm. um, highlighting strong differences in timing between males and females of songbirds, especially during spring migration. So males mi migrate up to two weeks ahead of females based on our ringing data. So there are time differences that we are aware of, um, similar to other flyways, but unfortunately we have very little um, spatial information because since we work with geolocators, we need to recapture the birds and we mainly recapture and capture males because they respond to playback of their song and are much easier to capture. So our sample size for females with geolocators is close to zero, given that they do not respond to playback and therefore we have it's more by chance that we recapture any bird with a locker. So this is really unfortunate. And this is something that, that we are missing actually in our data set and we hope we can resolve that in the future. But we know this time differences are real, but we don't know if they would also, for example, spend the, the non-breeding season in different areas, which would be very important for, for conservation. Thanks for flagging that, Wieland. And what, what, do you, what are you seeing from the, the birds that you're ringing in Hong Kong, Tung? Are you seeing similar patterns that is what, uh, what Wieland is seeing as well? Uh, we, can't, we can't find many uh, good information about it. So, uh, yeah, I cannot tell you a, a definite answer about it. But uh, in winter, uh, in autumn time, Sometimes I would think uh, uh, sexing by the uh, sexing the, 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 the birds by the plumage is quite difficult. Uh, we have some information, but we are not sure how good could be uh, for for some birds to be uh, separate uh, male or female. But uh, for us, we didn't see anything special uh, about the um, uh, male or females. But uh, males, uh, the sample size of males for most of us, uh, most of one thing in males plumage are actually quite underestimate, uh, uh, under rep uh, representative in, in autumn. On the other way, when we talk about the uh, lambert migration in springtime, we usually, yes, saw more ma uh, male birds than the female. So uh, maybe the time is different, but also maybe they use different uh, migration routes as well. So yeah, I mean, I, I cannot give any good uh, statistical test result about that, but but yeah, we yeah we see some difference. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Good one. Thanks, thanks for bringing this up, uh, um, Jan, and thanks to Willen and Tung for the very comprehensive answer. I noticed there's a question that I would like to take on, uh, and then I have uh, the the question is still accumulating. So what what I suggest we do is that uh, we've gone a bit over time. I'll take on one question. Um, I'll throw one more question back to the uh, to the speakers, and then we'll call it a night uh, for today because I know it's getting a bit late in Asia. So there's a question <laughs> coming from Christian Barna about the uh, threat to birds migrating in Vietnamese territory. Uh, she mentioned uh, you can see a lot of videos on YouTube with birds hunted, sold and eaten. How much impact can this have on the population of birds? Um, I think this is a really good point and I think Whelan has been able to give a bit of background on that as well. Uh, but Indo China, as we know, based on our, our surveys and our field work, uh, is one of those major hotspots for bird hunting in, in Asia, not just in Southeast Asia, but even broadly across Asia. And um, the surveys that uh, are coming out, you know, new surveys and the, the old surveys are telling us that uh, the numbers are quite uh, potentially unsustainable for many of these birds. One of those birds that I like to draw special attention to is the barn swallow, uh, because the barn swallow is a, a really known delicacy in some parts of Indochina. And the studies are showing that every year, millions and millions of them are taken. How would that affect the population? I think the impact could be quite considerable. And um, I know uh, some of my colleagues are working to crunch those numbers. We could probably give you uh, some update in the coming months. So um, that I hope addresses your question on Indochina and how uh, hunting there is a, is a major threat to birds, something that we need to act on, um, but also at the same time, we need to do more work to understand the scale of the problem uh, before we can bring in the conservation actions. There's this one last question that comes from Brian Wee and from Martha Sander about pandemic, uh, how the pandemic has affected. Uh, so let's have this as a last question and we'll call it a night. Um, so Martha has asked about uh, whether if you are seeing any differences in bird watching activity during the pandemic period. 
and uh, Brian is asking more about whether if the pandemic has affected the birds themselves. So there are really two questions about the pandemic itself. Uh, one, has it affected people bird watching and are they submitting more data or less data? And two, uh, are you seeing any impacts on the birds themselves? So maybe Tung could have a, have a go at this question first and then onward to Willen. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Yes, it is. This question is very, very, actually, it's very complicated, I would say. Uh, Hong Kong may be a bit different from the other places because uh, we cannot travel now. Uh, so, we uh, actually, I met more bird watchers in, in the field uh, during this period. Uh, so, I expect we could have more, uh, more uh, bird records uh, in the past uh, 12 months. Uh, but it may not be related to the uh, bird, migra uh, bird migration. So, I think it's all go back to the, um, the weather or the, the, the climate change, this kind of thing, or even habitat as well. So just to talk about the, uh, the pandemic, I think, yeah, we, it, it affects our, uh, the observer's behavior rather than the bird's behavior. So yes, I expect more bird records to be submitted uh, yeah, for the last year. <laughs> and what about you? What, what are your thoughts on this question, Willen? Um, I didn't look at the data so far, but um, one important thing about the pandemic when speaking about this is probably that um, wildlife markets have been closed in China due to the pandemic. So this is likely to affect wildlife trade on a really huge scale. And this might bring relief to many species heavily trapped because simply the markets mm. are closed. Mm, mm. Yeah, and, and, and I hope uh, this did, has a very yeah. positive effect on birds. But it's... Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, and, and that... Sorry, sorry to jump in so, uh, here. Um, and that you mentioned that, Whelan, uh, the, uh, it seems to me that a similar situation is happening in Vietnam as well. I think there's more enforcement action on the wildlife trade because of the pandemic. And so hopefully things get better for, for bird hunting in Vietnam uh, when authorities take more action on this. Yeah. So um, I think uh, with that, uh, we've really gone through a, a whirlwind of questions covering that whole spectrum of science and conservation and bird watching. And uh, on behalf of the team, I, I'm really grateful to, to Tong uh, and to Whelan for giving us this fantastic uh, odyssey uh, of the work that they have done, uh, ranging from tracking uh, of birds, you know, like what you've done in uh, Russia that has given us so much new insights on where these birds are migrating to, as well as to Tung, who, who has demonstrated to us the importance of citizen science, of outreach, and how we need to, to create that awareness for many of our land birds. I think putting all these together, I, I can imagine that in the years to come, there will be a, a rapid build up of momentum for our land. But so I'm very hopeful that this would drive more conservation action uh, going forward for our land birds in Asia. Uh, on this note, uh, I want to pass the floor back to Baron for a quick moment because Baron is going to tell you about our ongoing campaign for uh, bird hunting uh, around the world. Uh, and how the Bird Life Partnership is trying to mobilize resources to deal with bird hunting. I know Baron uh, has a few words to say, so at this at this point, I'll pass the floor back to Baron, and I will I will flash the slide to to amplify his uh, his message for us. Over to you, Baron. I think Dingley already more or less said what I was going to say, so he said it. I just wanted to flag that, as is clear from the talks of today, is that um, hunting is a serious threat, especially in Asia, when it comes to land birds. So we, as the BirdLife Partnership, as you know, that's a, a global pa partnership of uh, close to 120 organizations working together to, uh, to and among their priorities is stopping the illegal or irregulated uh, hunting of, uh, of birds. So to stop this threat, we, we do need support. So um, I'm putting up my slide. If you do have anything you could contribute to, it speaks to your heart that BirdLife partners around the world are working on this. It's not just in Asia, it's also in Europe and Africa. It's particularly a big problem in Arabia. It's a problem in the Americas as well. And uh, so we do try to, to team up. We have already some good successes. Some really good successes are around. Um, so if you want to hear about that, there are several other webinars have taken place uh, on this issue. So if you want to get a feel of what we're doing, look up the YouTube channel of BirdLife International and look at the, the two webinars we've, did on, uh, we've done on uh, illegal killing of birds. So 
if you can spare a few dollars or just one dollar, that's absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. I also want to mention that during this webinar, people are always curious about how many people did attend. So we were over 100 people today. The recording of the webinar will be shared afterwards. It will take us about a week to, um, to curate a little bit, do a little bit of editing, getting out the uncomfortable glitches. Um, and uh, we have participants from, uh, of course, from the East Asian and Austral Asian Flyway, a few participants from the Central Asian Flyway. But I'm also good to announce that we have people from South Africa and quite a few from Europe. Maybe they're hoping that the yellow-breasted bunting will return to them someday, and they are counting on the work done in the East Asian Observation Flyway to save that species. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, hope to see you soon.